Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. <clears throat> and I'm going to be going over the six-game early slate quickly. Um, since we've got uh, a lot of games on the docket here on a Saturday, uh, it's going to get kind of or it's getting kind of late in the morning. Um, we'll try and keep this pretty short. We've got a, a few aces on the mound here on Saturday, and one that should be an ace but has been terrible. Um, and another that is definitely an ace and is way underpriced. Um, Garrett Cole's been fantastic this season. Coming off a, what, a complete game shutout, right? Um, he was excellent against the Twins and walked one batter, two hits, and, and 10 Ks against the Twins. Um, he's 11,000, and finally we're starting to get some of these pitchers, I know we've had, you know, Shohei yesterday was 10-8. We've had uh, Scherzer 10-8. I believe Cole was even 10-9 in his last start. Um, but they're sufficiently pumping the prices on really the, the best few arms, or DFS arms in baseball. Um, and that's what we like to see. It makes it... Uh, a little, at least a little bit of a decision. Unfortunately, we do have Pablo Lopez down here, still 8,100. Um, he should be probably 97, 9,800 here. <laughs> uh, he, I think he should be the most, or the second most expensive behind Cole. Um, and this early ownership figure on him is about 40%. Uh, looking uh, quite low, to be honest. Uh, popping really hard, and obviously the, the point per dollar and the value metrics here uh, with a projection over 20. And it's a good matchup for him against Washington. We will briefly go into that, uh, maybe get some you know, Washington numbers and things like that. But Pablo's been fantastic. Introduced the sweeper this year, and 8100 is uh, uh, an excellent price tag for him. So we have McClanahan in a really bad matchup uh, at 96. He was great in his last start as well. Um, and also in a really bad matchup. Went six innings and got Toronto for six Ks. Just gave up the one run and on a, a couple of walks and four hits. So uh, really good outing from him as well. He was totally ignored because I believe he was on the slate with Cole last time also. Um Probably, I mean, certainly in the early runs here, not going to be the same. It is a short slate, of course. So, going to see some heavy ownership on him. Um, we'll dive into that a little bit. Could be fine. Obviously, the early median projection here from the broader industry is, is quite high as well. So, um, that's why we're seeing such a, a high ownership number of course but um you know and given that number definitely popping in the in the value metric so far um but the matchup is definitely not the greatest uh dylan cease on the other side of that game at nine thousand. price tag's fine for cease but uh he has not been great and there's a lot of variance with cease i mean his first couple of starts were good right six and a third five Struck out 10, struck out 8, right? Um, in one of those, a really bad matchup, his first his first outing against Houston, uh, that was a, a really strong performance. Next outing against San Francisco, uh, not so much. But that's really when the, the walks for Cease started to surface. He walked 5 in that San Francisco start, and that's what elevated the pitch count and allowed him to only go five innings. Did strike out eight, so the score was fine. The result was fine, but the underlying walks are always a problem with Dylan C. He's got one of the higher walk rates for a starting pitcher in baseball, and that's worrisome. So every everybody over here in the starting rotation for the White Sox, Michael Kopech, he's been giving up a lot of power, uh, Lucas Giolito giving up a lot of power, walking people as well. Dylan Cease, not so much in the power, but these walks are a big problem. He also had Baltimore, another difficult matchup, went six innings. This was a pretty poor weather game, I believe, in his last start, um, but also walked five there, just struck out 
just the five. So um, some variance definitely with Dylan Cease, and he gets a pretty tough matchup himself in Tampa Bay on the other side. So that's why we're seeing, at least relative to the other guys, a depressed number. Now, 18-point median projection is still very high, and he's coming in at sub-20%. So I think this is a fine tournament piece. Uh, we'll get into Tampa Bay's numbers here in a little bit. Dustin May coming off a really bad outing uh, in his previous performance against the Mets. They beat him up uh, pretty good. Went five and two-thirds, just struck out the one. And the Mets have been doing that to everybody this season, right? Very low strikeout rate to both righties and lefties. And Dustin May gave up five earned in that start. Sprayed it a little bit. Um not in terms of control, but in terms of uh, batted balls and whatnot. So this could be a decent bounce spot. However, the Cubs have been fantastic recently. Uh, really seeing the baseball top to bottom um, in pretty much whoever they put in the lineup. Cody Bellinger's having an excellent April so far. He's been great. Uh, Nico's been excellent. Not a lot of power normally from Nico, but uh, an excellent uh, leadoff hitter. Gets on base, makes a lot of contact there. So those couple of guys with the, I guess, reduced a little bit strikeouts of Patty Wisdom and the power still there. Uh, he's really cleaning the bases out for them. Um, they've had some good matchups recently, and they've had some okay pitching on the mound. Obviously, uh, Drew Smiley was perfect into the eighth inning yesterday. Uh, against the Dodgers. So, um, fine matchup for Dustin May. Still throws hard. Price tag is okay, but we're still kind of worried about strikeout upside for May in general. I think this is a fine tournament play. Very low ownership here on a six-game slate. Um, this could be pretty reasonable. Can't expect Dustin May to be to to be pitching to that much contact necessarily. He normally keeps the ball down in the strike zone pretty well. And up against the Mets, uh, that was admittedly a, a pretty terrible matchup for him. So um, understandable that he got he got hit around a little. But an, intri an, an intriguing price tag and a, and a fine price pivot up off of the major chalk here with uh, with Pablo Lop Lopez down at 8100. Uh, as I mentioned, this price tag and probably where we're going to line up in in lineup construction here today. Um, Quite low for Pablo, and I like this a lot. So when I start building teams, I, I got a feeling I'm going to end up getting quite a bit of Pablo here. Now, uh, Logan Webb um, would also be an interesting price pivot at lower ownership. Down here at 7,100, or excuse me, 7,700 off the, off the 81 from Pablo, but he unfortunately gets the Mets as well. Now... It's a little bit of a different story. Logan Webb's ground ball stuff and strikeout stuff are both better than Dustin Mays. So the matchup, just from a, a raw Arsenal perspective, is a little bit better, even though they're both face, you know, facing the same team, right? Um, here against the Mets, but undoubtedly the Mets uh, in in day games in San Francisco. Um, should be warm out there today. The the ball tends to fly a little bit better, number one. And the Mets, they don't strike out at all. So could be a little bit of a difficult spot here. But once again, on, on a six-game slate, a, an interesting tournament piece with a fine median projection. 15-16 uh, points in this particular matchup is probably one of the higher numbers you're going to see against the Mets all season. Not many arms in baseball are going to project as well. And Logan Webb's got really good stuff. High ground ball rate, decent strikeout stuff, and he runs deep into games. So um, plenty enough in the tank for Logan Webb to suppress the Mets here, um, but undoubtedly a, a pretty bad K matchup. Kyle Freeland gets Philadelphia. He was awful in his last start, um, and he had been good in his first few starts. So we were kind of on edge here a little bit with Kyle, and... He's never going to strike out many people, and that's really the problem that we run into with Freeland. Um, he he has fine stuff, and he can compete, and when he's got it rolling, um, 
he can run deep into in, into a game and throw you six innings and suppress pretty well. Um, but as a DFS arm, it's generally pretty difficult because he pitches to so much contact. And a lot of the time, it's not uh, it's not necessarily terribly hard contact, right? But uh, a few too many fly balls given that much contact. And they're playing a day game over here in Philly. Once again, a, a pretty bad batted ball matchup. And here at 7,100, I think we'd probably rather get to a guy a little bit cheaper here. Alec Manoa, I think this is a, a fine bounce spot for Manoa. He's not been great either. Been hit around in the early going here. And hurts his first, what, three, four starts. Um, had one good start against, unfortunately, that was the Royals. But he got beat up against Detroit, which is not good. He walked four batters there. He got beat up against Tampa in his last start, gave up seven earned in four and two-thirds, walked four batters. And he also walked four batters against the, in, in that good start against the Royals where he went seven innings, struck out just five. Also walked a couple of guys and, and got hit around in three and a third in his first start of the season against St. Louis. So Manoa struggling to find it a little bit here in the early going. Um Given those results, perhaps a, a quite aggressive median projection. And Alec Manoa is not typically known as a, a strikeout pitcher here. Um, but a good price tag, as he's no longer in the upper 7Ks, where we've had him early in the early part of the season, 7,900, 7,700, 7, 7, um, etc. He's down here at 68. So... The matchup is starting to get priced in. Of course, the results are starting to get priced in as well. And the walks are a problem. That's that's pretty worrisome. He's been walking a lot of guys. And this is at Yankee Stadium in a small ballpark. And, of course, if you start walking people, putting people on base ahead of the power bats, like a Judge, Glaber, um, Anthony Rizzo, then you could be in, in pretty bad territory. And the Yankees could start to... Uh, start jumping on you pretty bad here. So, um, but I think at 6,800, the, that, some of that risk is starting to get priced in. And I think we could probably take some shots here. David Peterson down here as well. Uh, he had a pretty damn good start against the Dodgers in his last outing, I believe. Um, it was against the Dodgers. He did give up six earned runs. So <laughs> scratch that on the, on the pretty damn good start comment. But, uh, he lasted six innings, and and he struck out six. I suppose that's a little bit of a silver lining for him. Uh, does have K stuff, but has contact issues, certainly uh, two righties. Um, so I think this is an interesting tournament spot here for both he and San Francisco. Price tag at 6500 is very attainable. It's come off a little bit. He was in the upper sixes and lower sevens in his first few starts this year um sprayed it a little bit in a in a start or two as far as the control goes walk five batters in his outing against M milwaukee for example but overall the control has been good uh in the in the three starts after that but the last couple of outings last few outings, gave up five against uh, against milwaukee Two against San Diego, six against the Dodgers. So um, a little bit of variance here with David Peterson, but the price tag also accounting for that a little bit here down at, at 6,500. I think this is a another fine tournament piece that we could probably play both sides. And you get the Mets over here. This could be a, a decent pitcher, like a hidden pitchers matchup with uh, with Logan Webb and David Peterson. Uh, Hayden Wisniewski gets the Dodgers at 6,300. Uh, we really liked him in his last start for a pretty strong bounce. Um, however, today, perhaps not the uh, not the best spot. I know the Dodgers nearly got no hit yesterday. Um, but we can't really expect that type of performance to persist out of the Dodgers. Now, they, they've been pretty bad. Um, but the, I mean, they've been missing Mookie for the last, few games i know he came back off the paternity list but um they've been struggling quite a bit to get it going and a lot of the problem hasn't necessarily been their offense which hasn't been great admittedly they're striking out a lot uh, and they really haven't gotten it going 
but it's mostly been their pitching staff that has given them issues, and they're they're giving up a lot of runs, and their offense can't score ten runs a game, uh, unfortunately. So um, over here against Wisniewski, I think this is a decent bounce spot and also a decent regression spot. Not sure that Wisniewski is this good. Uh, of course, he he got Oakland in his last start and went seven innings, struck out seven, and suppressed pretty well. Just gave up the one run, which was early, I believe, uh, may have been in the first inning. Um, that said, we can expect a little bit of, of normalization, I suppose, in the performances for both the Dodgers and Wisniewski um, in a in a markedly worse matchup, batted ball wise for Wisniewski against Dodgers, and we simply just can't expect the Dodgers to be this poor on offense. Now, it's an intriguing price tag for sure. He's also down here at the same price he was against Oakland. So I'm not sure the value is still there. Um, there was quite a bit of upside not priced in for Wisniewski in his last outing against a really poor lineup, but the Dodgers are not the same uh, level of poor that Oakland is, of course. Um, intriguing price, for sure, and it's a six-game slate. You can really mix in some guys, because the Dodgers have been bad, and a 12-point median projection is not nothing. Um, it's on the lower end, but surely one of the one of the higher numbers down here uh, at the bottom of the pricing spectrum. Um Chad Cool, we're probably not going to want to touch. He doesn't have any K stuff. He pitches to way too much hard contact. Twins probably going to be a very popular stack for you here today. Um, he gives it up to both lefties and righties. So I think there's this is a, a pretty good, as long as we've got weather that will um, accommodate us here today. Uh, who knows if it's going to snow again or, or, or whatever. Um, let's see if I can pull up temps here just quickly on the other monitor yeah it's freezing cold again uh i mean 35 40 degrees um with a pretty strong breeze so not the best hitting weather and that's probably why we're seeing a little bit of an elevated projection for chad cool than what you would see otherwise uh 5300 is once again a fine price tag for a, a starting pitcher that's probably going to go out there like he's stretched out um, but admittedly, like he, <laughs> yeah, you're a better man than me. Um, if you are, are punting some Chad cool, even in 35 degree weather, uh, the stuff isn't that great. It's hard to hold the baseball in weather this cold, especially when it is breezy with a wind chill. Um, this will be below free. This is a bad, bad time for baseball, but, um, as Bobby and I talked about a little bit yesterday, it's unfortunate that this is an inner league game. Um, they, they kind of have to get these in, uh, and they, they canceled, or they actually played their game yesterday. It's the Cleveland game I'm thinking of that got postponed, but, um, you know, they got to get these games in because there isn't a whole lot of time in interleague play, especially to, to make anything up. So they're going to try and get this in and just kind of gut through it. Uh, but admittedly, for both Pablo and Chad Cool, pretty terrible weather here. And um, now we did see Tyler Molly in also pretty bad weather last night throw pretty well. Now, the, the matchup for um, Minnesota pitching is undoubtedly pretty damn good against Washington. Uh, not so much for Washington pitching. Now, Minnesota has been pretty frustrating to play because they're the upper the guys at the upper lineup or at the top of the lineup I should say uh, have been pretty disappointing Buxton down to 4600 today that's kind of an insane price tag for him we we're getting to the point where we got to price and force and just play some guys um, even though they've been this bad 44 for Correa Max Kepler leading off now at 34 they do have uh, Eddie Julian they may have sent him down I'm not totally sure here but um, I would expect that he would be in the lineup. Um, he's performed okay since they called him up. Um, nevertheless, uh, Trevor Larnick, he's been striking out a, bat, a boatload and, and struggling quite a bit. 
uh, here in the early going. But 3600 is a very good price for him as well. Um, Georgie Polanco is back, so they did, they perhaps did send Eddie Julian back down. Um, in any case, very cheap here, and given their even in 35 degree weather that they're facing Chad Cool, they're probably going to be quite popular uh, here in in Minnesota. But terrible hitting weather for sure. Um, you know, really, really cold, and uh, it's not going to be pleasant to be standing out there playing baseball today. So, um, perhaps an opportunity in, in tournaments to just get somewhere else, uh, but it's going to be pretty chalky getting to, to Cole and the Twins here today. Um, you're not fooling anybody if that's your initial build thought. Uh, and lastly, we have Christopher Sanchez on the mound. He's coming up from the minors here. He is stretched out through, I believe, 80 pitchers or so in his last uh, rehab start. Um, and we can briefly get into the numbers here. So that's a quick overview for us um, on who we've got on the mound. Looks like we've got a, a couple of pretty obvious spots, right? We we do like Garrett Cole. We hate the matchup in general against Toronto, but this is Garrett Cole, and I'm not sure we care about it. Um, we do care that he's 11,000 now in a bad match. Excuse me, in a bad matchup. Um so perhaps we can get to some tournament plays like a Dustin May against the Cubs, 8,300. Not wild about the price tag, of course. I would certainly rather just play Pablo. Uh, but I think we could potentially consider tournament plays on Logan Webb as well. Initially a high median projection. Um, so let's take a look at uh, a couple of the numbers here uh, you know, for maybe some of these guys down here at the bottom, notably a David Peterson uh, or a Christopher Sanchez. See if we can target some of these guys on on the mound to either play or stack against. So let's get to uh, the Colorado and Philly game. Just as we kind of bounce around here. Um, Freeland, as we, as we talked about, probably an unlikely target here at this price tag against Philly today. Uh, now we can't likely expect a, a bounce from Freeland. So at very low ownership, he's he has 20 point upside at this price tag and exceptionally low ownership. And similar to the Wisniewski regression and the Dodgers bounce that we talked about, we like kind of playing playing the waves a little bit um, in baseball and buying pieces of players that had some kind of outsized, uh, terrible performances, notably pitchers. Harder to do with hitters, of course, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and and similarly, maybe taking maybe taking a stand or two and, and fading uh, a pitcher that has had an excellent performance is now whose price tag has perhaps come up or is now in a markedly worse matchup in the case of Wisniewski today. So. Um, we do like playing the waves like that, and I think Kyle Freeland certainly qualifies as a a candidate in this regard. Now the Phillies been they've been taken apart pretty good in the last couple of days. Um, now Noah Davis wasn't as good as Ryan Feltner the day before, but Noah Davis was still pretty good. And unfortunately for him, there were a couple of uh, he got squeezed a little bit. And there was one call that went against him, a hit batter on JT Romuto, that was kind of a, a phantom hit batter. JTR said he got hit, and the umpire just kind of gave him first base. Um, Bud Black shortly thereafter got thrown out, uh, and, but he had a case because baseball didn't hit him. Um, and that loaded the bases, really, for Noah Davis here. So it... He actually got out of that inning, but it elevated the pitch count. He wasn't able to go deep into the game or deeper than he may have otherwise been able to uh, had that sort of goofy sequence not occurred. That All of that is to say that the Phillies have really not been great here in some pretty decent matchups so far against Colorado pitching and the Colorado bullpen. Um, so it's not unreasonable at all to take some shots on Kyle Freeland at 7,100. This is a six-game slate once again. And if you end up playing a pretty chalky stack like a Dodgers, for example, um, or Philly on the other side, like you're going to have to make some 
contrarian decisions like this. Obviously, you're not going to stack Philly against Freeland, but um, if you get to a, a a chalky stack, perhaps like uh, like the Yankees, maybe they they might see a little ownership today against Alec Manoa. Um, and you correlate with Cole or something, you might need to get to a Freeland uh, to get different. And it's it's an option. Not to say that's a uh, a viable construction. I don't know. I haven't built teams or, any, or anything like that. So I'm not sure how pricing is, is shaking out just yet, but that could be a viable construction. So Chris Sanchez on the other side, he's 5,000, but mostly a bullpen arm um, in the last season. Plus here, pretty low strikeout rate and... Doesn't really have anything great in the way of an arsenal. Has trouble throwing strikes, certainly getting ahead of hitters, and that's unfortunately a pretty bad spot against the Rockies. Now, they have one of the lower walk rates in baseball as a team, and as we can see here in the early going, just 200 PAs uh, against lefties, but a 7% walk rate and a 27% strikeout rate. So they're still striking out a lot perhaps inflated a little bit by the uh, thrashing from Matt Strom they took the other night. But Rocky's still going to strike out, not an overly patient team, not an overly disciplined team at the plate. So that could aid Sanchez as well. But uh, nonetheless, if you're throwing kind of uncompetitive pitches out of the hand early in the count, you pretty much anybody is going to be able to jump on you. And the Rockies even put up three spot on Aaron Nola last night in the first inning when Ryan McMahon got to him. So um, with a, a highly or a, a higher variance arm here in Chris Sanchez, uh, that is a, that has a bullpen arsenal, right? A, a pretty league average uh, two seamer, I should say. Uh, at a, a heavy usage, um, well below average slider and a league average changeup, uh, he's going to have problems getting out right-handed hitters. And that is one thing that Colorado can do, is they can platoon from the right side. They've got a lot of right-handed hitters with a good bit of pop, uh, notably Chris Bryant, CJ Crone. Elias Diaz has pop behind the plate. He's still 3700 This price tag hasn't really changed. But the prices on Crone and Bryant have come down a little bit. 5000 5100 for Bryant and Crone. Uh, Ellery Spontero has plenty of pop. Jonathan Daza, not so much, but he makes a lot of contact. And the couple of young righties down at the bottom of the lineup, uh, Alan Treo, Zeke Tovar, and, of course, Jury hits from both sides as well. So they can really platoon here. Um... Charlie Blackman is actually a career 300 hitter against lefties himself. So not really uh, Ryan McMahon is probably the only terribly weak spot in terms of platoon. Um, and who knows what they'll, what they'll do with him. They do have a couple of guys that they can mix in on the infield. They don't, they really want McMahon in there for his defense because Montero leaves quite a bit on the table in that department. But um, you can get to, I, I think some, some Rockies here and even include McMahon because he's 4,100 and he's got pop against everybody. So if we're seeing some non-competitive pitches out of the hand from Chris Sanchez, it's going to put McMahon in, in favorable counts and you kind of negate your platoon advantage uh, when you do that sort of thing. So um, not an excellent target here. Price-wise, this is attractive, and he's stretched out. So if you're looking to take shots on a, a pretty, on some pretty low ownership, um, the batted ball matchup, there's a lot of hard contact coming from Chris Sanchez, two righties, is not good. So price-wise, that is good. Um, some of that risk is priced in, and, and the Rockies are still pretty bad. Uh, they're going to, like I said, swing and miss. Uh, quite a bit and make a lot of soft contact. So it's it's a reasonable tournament play to get to a $5,000 arm. Uh, however, you can also stack the Rockies on the other side. So I think this is an interesting tournament play here today. Nobody's going to play the Rockies because nobody ever plays the Rockies because Rockies are bad. So uh, Philly's probably going to be pretty popular, certainly, seeing anywhere from 15 to 25% ownership on, on the various pieces in, in the lineup over here. Uh, they are still quite expensive to get to 61 for Trey 59 coming down a little bit for Schwarber Castellano still up at 49 Marsh back up to five um 
hard to hard to get some of to some of these guys, and admittedly not the best matchup for Schwarber or Brandon Marsh on the downside of the platoon. We'll see what they want to do with Bryson Stott up at the top of the lineup. Um, could perhaps lead off at Josh Harrison or or something like that. Uh, they may just kind of run with it. Could just lead off Trey. Now we don't want to go after Trey necessarily, but uh, might make it a little bit difficult to stack full stack these guys against Freeland. 5,700 for JTR. I mean, he's a fantastic hitting catcher uh, and one of the best plays daily that you're going to find. But if you want to full stack this team, this is very, very expensive. It's going to probably make it impossible for you to get to Cole unless you do something like play a Chris Sanchez down here at 5,000. Um, a tournament build nonetheless, but uh, probably not my favorite construction. A little imbalance there, I would say. So, um, offensively price adjusted i think i would probably have to side with the rockies here but uh, you can certainly go after kyle again because he pitches to so much contact uh okay so let's get into perhaps this um david peterson shenanigans quickly as well against the against the giants and then we might wrap it up after that just give us some ideas of some cheaper arms we'd like to get to to maybe pair with a cole um or a mclean hand if we get there or a, oh, I don't know, or a very chocolate Pablo Lopez. Um, Dave Peterson at 65, 14% right now. I think this is a fine tournament target because he does have K stuff, right? But we've talked about the power issues and, and the contact. It's actually coming to lefties. And in his last start, both Freddie Freeman and Max Muncy got to him. Uh, and I think that was, at least in the early going, the only real damage against him. Um, so still some susceptibility to the left side. Not so much in the way of average, but a lot of power here. A lot of hard contact. 2.4 homers per nine is probably a little noisy in, in a short sample here. But that's because he's his four-seamer sinker combo is, just, is not very good. Doesn't have a, a wipeout pitch to the left side of the plate. And... Unfortunately, the Giants, they're going to also be able to platoon here um, a good bit. So that's good for David Peterson in that regard. They're unlikely, the Giants, to leave a lot of their high upside lefties in the lineup. So I think that makes David Peterson a pretty reasonable tournament play here at some depressed ownership. He still throws gas and still has the 26% K rate to either side, despite the fact that he's giving up what 39% hard contact and a 254 ISO to lefties so far, he has a 31% K rate there. So um, even if they are in the lineup, San Francisco's probably still going to strike out quite a bit. Their righties will make a good bit more contact, hit for a little bit more average. But the walks are, are kind of concerning for David Peterson too. 54%, 53% strike one rate with a full 10% walk rate and giving up hard contact really pushing 30% to the right side as well. Um, high line drive rate to the right side also. So this is kind of worrisome batted ball wise. I think there's a lot of susceptibility. You can get to some tournament giant stacks as well. If you are not sold on, on taking some shots on David Peterson and attacking a very high upside K rate matchup um, in the early going here, we had against lefties, Giants striking out at an alarming 30% clip, 60 WRC plus with a 103 ISO. Um, as we can see briefly down here, their batted ball matchup uh, does not really favor them in this particular spot. So I think there's reasonable constructions that we could get to on both sides of the game here, playing some Giants. They have plenty of guys from the right side that can... Hit for some pop. Wilmer Flores still underpriced, I think, at 3,300. Pretty good, consistent hitter there. Might see a Michael Conforto in the list, as a matter of fact. Um, certainly not the upside of his platoon split, but uh, not bad for sure. J.D. Davis, of course. Darren Ruff, 2,400 at first base. It's a really cheap piece that you can get to. David Villar has a lot of pop. Um, Helio Ramos down at the bottom of the lineup. He's 2,000 flat for you if you'd like to get there. Really the only... Outsized expensive piece is Tyro Estrada. He'll likely lead off second and shortstop eligibility at 5,300. Kind of tough to get there. 
but he's been fine as well. So um, they have some righties that they're probably going to try to platoon. And as I mentioned, that does play into Peterson here a little bit. So this is an interesting tournament spot for both sides. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Peterson gets beat up a little bit because the Giants can be kind of sticky despite their really undisciplined 30% strikeout rate against lefties so far. But uh, they've been a little bit better um, over, the, over the last week or so, seeing the baseball a little bit better. So uh, interesting tournament game here. And quickly, I guess, since we're here, we'll get to Logan Webb. Very low ownership on him at 10%. Admittedly, an awful, awful strikeout matchup. Against righties, they're striking out at a 16.5% clip. 113 WRC+. Plus. And normally, in good righty-righty matchups, you want to go after their big power hitters like a Pete Alonzo. But he's been fantastic. He's got like 14 bombs or something already. Um, and he really only strikes out at about a 21-22% clip against right-handers anyway. So... Um, Hard to attack the the Mets. A lot of really patient and, and and really pesky hitters. Brandon Nimmo at the top, certainly. Starling Marte, pretty damn good hitter. They got him in the two. And, of course, Frankie Lindor hitting from both sides in the three. Um, Jeff McNeil bookending the those guys at the top in the five hole. He's a cheap piece for you at 3,700 with the platoon advantage. And he makes a lot of contact himself. So very difficult list to get through over here for the Mets. Interesting tournament spot though, nonetheless, because Logan Webb has such a high ground ball rate, 2.4 ground balls per fly ball, very high to both sides of the plate, huge K stuff, 25% to the right side, leaves it on the table quite a bit, just 19% to the lefties who will hit for some more average. So that does make me a little bit nervous when we go after a Logan Webb. But the price tag here for for uh, for Logan is undoubtedly very attractive. 7,700, um, he's really kind of been in this range the whole season. But we saw in his first start against a really potent lineup, he got the Yankees for six innings and struck out 12, right? So the there's hidden K stuff in there when he's really got the slider and the changeup combination going, keeps it on the ground with the sinker down in the strike zone. So um, interesting tournament spot here for sure, but uh, probably not my favorite. I really don't like going after the Mets. Um, but I think a, a really interesting game and, and something that you can consider for some tournament builds. So hopefully that'll just kind of give us a, a couple ideas here. Um, you know, what, there are some walks that we want to attack, like a Dylan Cease up here. Uh, Alec Manoa has been walking people. Um, you could put, perhaps get to a, a pretty popular Shane McClanahan in a in a difficult spot. Uh, I think that's a reasonable play on a short slate here. Uh, if you want to come off of a little bit of, of Garrett Cole, um, I mean, you're not at the moment getting an ownership discount. You are getting a $1,400 price discount, which is nice. So if you need that, I think McClanahan is a fine target. This is still one of the better arms in baseball, and he can tear apart any lineup despite a pretty bad batted ball matchup and strikeout matchup against the White Sox. Now, they don't have Tim Anderson um, at the top, which would make it much worse and almost take me off of McClanahan completely. But they've got a lot of righties as well. Luis Robert, Andrew Vaughn, Eloy is back. Jake Berger, Grandal hits from the right side. Sebi Zavala behind the plate will hit from the right side as well. Plus a notorious pesky hitter in Elvis Andrews. You've got a Romy Gonzalez with some pop down at the bottom of the lineup. And a Lennon Sosa, cheap second base shortstop piece um, in, the, in the bottom, what is that, in the eight hole. Uh, for them as well. So they, they can platoon over here against McClanahan, um, and it could be a, uh, a pretty low upside strikeout matchup for him in general. So something to consider there as well. But uh, overall, I think our, our chalk piece is certainly going to be Cole and Pablo Lopez. Got to keep an eye out for the weather there. Um, they're probably going to try and get it in as it's an interleague game, but uh, I would not be surprised if Pablo even struggles here a little bit. It's hard to grip the baseball, um, and his best pitch anymore is the sweeper. So he's going to need to be able to to grip and hold onto the onto the ball pretty well there uh, to get it to really bite and and slide horizontally against the the righties over here for Washington. So um, that's your chalk pairing for sure, but. In tournaments, I think we can make a couple of pivots here. You can get to a Kyle Freeland if you'd like. It's kind of a throw-up play. Not a lot of strikeouts there, but um, 
if you want to take some shorts on some very expensive Philly stacks uh, and what are undoubtedly going to be some pretty popular um, constructions over there with, with Philly, I think that's a reasonable tournament play. You can get to some Alec Manoa, even though the strikeout stuff isn't all that great. He's been walking people. Um, you can get also play the Yankees over here. Interesting tournament spot uh, for them as well. So uh, I think you can you can get different with it today here for sure. There's only probably a couple of arms that I personally am, am not going to end up going near. But I think every single one of these guys is viable to play, either due to pricing uh, or uh, regression or anything like that, um, or just raw upside. Outside of maybe a Chris Sanchez, I'm not overly interested there, but he's, he's 5,000. You can still play him. Uh, Chad Cool is probably the only bat that I would uh, personally come off of. He just pitches to way too much contact for my liking. Um, even in awful hitting weather at 35 degrees, um, I'm still not super interested in that. But uh, Or really what's Nesky here. But the prices on these guys are attainable in tournaments, and this is, once again, a six-game slate. So um, get different with it. We do have projections up on the site, and they will be updated as we get into locks. So good luck here on the early.